Okay, uh, good evening everyone and welcome to UCL. It's great to see so many people here this evening. My name is Oliver Patel and I'm a research associate and manager of UCL's European Institute. The European Institute is UCL's hub for research, collaboration and engagement on Europe. We run a busy public event series on a wide range of topics relating to Euro European affairs and we strive to ensure that UCL academic research reaches as wide an audience as possible. Tonight's event is co-organized with UCL Public Policy and UCL Public Policy builds engagement between researchers and the policy world. This evening, we're going to be discussing the future of artificial intelligence, ethics, policy, and regulation. So this event has proved extremely popular, was um, sold out very quickly, and clearly many people are interested. It's obviously a really timely topic, so just this week, I've seen stories in the media about the rise of deep fakes in political campaigning, facial recognition systems being used in job application processes, and medical diagnosis systems outperforming top doctors. So there's clearly a lot of stuff going on at the moment, and um, our distinguished panel is going to get through a lot of these topics. Um, so before I introduce the panel, I just wanted to do a quick gauge of audience opinion. So can I just have a show of hands? Who here is very worried and scared about the future of artificial intelligence? Okay, it looks like 50-50, interesting. Well, hopefully our panelists can allay some of these concerns or increase them. <laughs> um, so yeah, just to introduce the speakers um, from right to left. So first of all, Paul Niemitz. So Paul Niemitz is principal advisor at the European Commission's Director General of Justice and Consumers, and he plays a leading role in developing the EU's policy on AI. And prior to this, Paul spent six years as Director of Fundamental Rights at the European Commission, where he led on the GDPR. He's a visiting professor at the College of uh, Europe in Bruges and is a trained lawyer with extensive legal experience. And then next to Paul is Professor Helen Margots. So Helen Margots is Professor of Society and the Internet at the University of Oxford. She was Director of the Oxford Internet Institute from 2011 to 2018. And Helen, since 2018, Helen has been director of the public policy program at the Alan Turing Institute, which is the UK's national institute for data science and artificial intelligence. Her policy and research interests include criminal justice and hate speech. Helen is a political scientist and she sits on the board of the UK government's Digital Economy Council. And Helen was recently elected fellow of the British Academy. And next to Helen is uh, Professor Geraint Rees. Geraint is Professor of Cognitive Neurology at UCL and is also the Dean of UCL's Faculty of Life Sciences. Uh, Geraint also recently, assumed, uh, recently took up the newly created post of UCL's Pro Vice Provost for Artificial Intelligence. And in this role, he leads on UCL's AI strategy. He chairs the AI steering group at UCL and is leading on the AI for People and Planet initiative, which I'm sure we'll hear more about this evening. Geraint's research focuses on the neural basis of consciousness. He's been awarded the Royal Society Francis Crick Medal. And uh, finally, Dr. Joanna Bryson. So Dr. Joanna Bryson is reader in the Department of Computer Science at the University of Bath. Joanna is a renowned expert on cognition and intelligence, and she builds theories of intelligence into working AI models. She also focuses on robots and AI ethics, which includes empirical research on how to make AI more transparent and accountable. And from February 2020, Joanna is moving to the Hertie School of Governance in Berlin to assume the role of Professor of Ethics and Technology. So a very, very distinguished panel to, to, to discuss these issues tonight. So in terms of the format, Paul Niemitz is going to kick things off with uh, an overview of the, e the EU's approach to AI policy and governance. And then Helen is going to come in and talk a bit about uh, the landscape in the UK. We'll then have a discussion between the panelists, followed by hopefully a lively and long Q&A with the audience. The hashtag for tonight's event is UCLAI, and we'll be, uh, we'll be filming for our YouTube channel and we sincerely hope that no one's face ends up in a dystopian machine learning facial recognition algorithm, <laughs> but we can't make any promises. So without further ado, Paul Niemitz. Thank you very much and uh, great to be here uh, in London. I'm a great friend of uh, 
British science, and I hope uh, British science at least will continue staying uh, with us uh, on the continent, and there will be continued exchanges so uh, that we can continue to benefit, in particular, of course, in EU law from the great books which have been written on EU law uh, by British professors. Now, um, our subject uh, today, um, artificial intelligence, is uh, not just a specific technological subject and a technicality. It is really <clears throat> one of uh, the great uh, issues of our times. Of course, AI as a term is overused as a marketing tool for many things. If you today uh, want to sell a uh, startup, you say AI is in it, and you, you know, the markup of the price immediately 30%, and in any program you buy now it's AI, so it's a marketing term. But behind it, the concept of uh, machine learning, of programs which um, can develop in a way that was not entirely foreseeable for the creator um, is, of course, a great potential uh, for mankind, um, but also entails risks. So that's why um, in the European Commission, since a few years, we are looking at this field of technology as we look at any other uh, field of technology and policy. And in, uh, in April um, in 2018, uh, we came up with a strategic communication on uh, um, AI for Europe and the trustworthy AI concept was born. This communication sets out three big areas of work. First, developing AI in terms of research, uh, becoming leaders uh, in AI, also not only in research but also in adoption of AI in the economy and the public uh, services. Second, preparation of the labor market. People have to learn how to handle this technology. Uh, training uh, is necessary for this. Uh, one of the biggest um, um, uh, obstacles to investment in new technologies is always the so-called mismatch. You have a great technology, but boy, where do you find the people who are able to deal with this, and in particular for small and medium enterprises, this mismatch is, is always a great challenge. So the labor market has to transform. And third, uh, law and ethics uh, for AI. Why? <clears throat> because we are convinced that uh, in the long run, uh, both for the economy, for sustainable profits, but also for sustainable society, it, it is important to always accompany um, technology uh, with law and rules which ensure that we get the best and the upside of the technology and we avoid the worst. And we have always done this, you know, uh, for the cars, it has taken 10 years until there's legislation on the seatbelt, but it has half um, uh, the number of deaths um, you know, on the road. There's a long history of regulating technology by law, and there's really no reason uh, not to continue with this uh, in the future. So these were the three work strands which are moving forward. Of course, they are linked uh, to um, money, but I would like to focus now on the question of ethics and law uh, relating to uh, AI. And I would like to say, first of all, um, that um, all the talk about Europe uh, being great in rulemaking while others are great in developing AI technologies and making money is completely wrong. If you look uh, to China, and now I'm referring to reports by the Financial Times in particular, already between 2018 and 2017, the private investment in AI has uh, been going down by more than 30%. And uh, if you look at this year's reports, the valuation of the AI companies have really plummeted in China. And of course, there are many reasons. One is the trade war, uh, which has started between the US and China. But there is another reason which pertains to rules which is that <clears throat> in the same way that people have doubts about hardware, which comes from China, the Huawei security issue, of course you have to ask yourself when you um, um, scale, when you want to scale a business concept of AI, a software concept, a service concept, will this be possible to scale this worldwide? And the answer is, as long as you don't build in AI rules which make sure that it complies with the principle of rule of law, that it operates legally, that it is, does not destroy democracy, that it respects our fundamental rights, this cannot scale worldwide because probably its operation in democracies and in free countries will not be legal. 
So uh, to say it bluntly, the type of AI technology which is developed in China, and in particular if you think of AI for surveying of people, for herding people and humans like cattle, for fulfilling the dream of the Communist Party to control their people um, and to fulfill communism through technology, which was the dream since the Russian Revolution in the past. It was a heavy investment in technology, you know, building bridges, steel, and so on. Today it's AI. Uh, this technology developed for this purpose is not scalable in democratic and free societies. And I think the markets are starting to understand this. At the same time, let's talk for a moment about technology uh, in Europe. It is clear that in the consumer markets, the US it has always been uh, you know, in the front, and uh, not only since we have AI, we've always bought records of American pop music. We grew up with jeans, Levi's, uh, we eat Kellogg's conflicts. This is the global division of labor, consumer markets, the US is great. So no wonder that uh, Facebook, Google, and so on, they are successful companies. Nobody has a problem with it. In principle, uh, you know, of course, competition law issues that are there, but they are there in the United States, like they're here. The big debate about um, um, uh, regulating these companies or splitting them up is, first of all, an American debate. But uh, when we look away from the consumer market, when we look uh, more at AI used in B2B relationships, um, actually, Europe is uh, very, very good, well positioned. Of course, we have to invest in this technology like in any other, but there is really no reason to walk around head down and say, oh God, are we bad, and oh, how our laws are inhibiting uh, investment. This is not the case, and um, this type of argument has been made Already against uh, GDPR, you know, we were told in the legislative process we would lose 5% of GDP if we adopt uh, GDPR. And the reality is the country in Europe, which already had highest standards of uh, data protection before GDPR, also had the highest growth rates. And we're continuing on a path of growth with GDPR. And now in America, in California, the law is adopted in the same direction, and suddenly, uh, uh, even in Washington, there's a discussion that it would be good to have such a law. Why? Because in order to sell technology and keep it acceptable, you need rules which reassure people that they're not being screwed. And this is the case both for private data, this is regulated by GDPR, but also when technology deals with other data, and this will be the great challenge for AI. So let's be clear, when we think about law and ethics, we have done a lot of work uh, in Europe. Uh, we had a high-level group on ethics for AI, which has set out a number of principles which are important. But the crucial question we are uh, now facing is, which of these issues identified in this group of ethics, and not only in this group, but in the 70 other groups which have existed around the world to discuss and work on ethics codes uh, for AI, which of these Issues of ethics require law and regulation, and which of these issues can you, on the other hand, with good conscience, leave to self-regulation and ethics codes and promises by companies? And um, I will first anticipate uh, for you that in the political um, um, guidance, the new president of the Commission, uh, Mrs. van der Leyen, has set out before the European Parliament, um, she has clearly said, in the first 100 days in office, I will put forward legislation for a co coordinated European approach on the human and ethical implications of artificial intelligence. This should also look at how we can use big data for innovation that creates wealth for our societies and our business. So there will be a legislative proposal. We will have broad consultations on this, uh, obviously. But the question is, what's going to be in it? And how do we arrive at this content? And uh, what I would like uh, to discuss with you tonight is that the thesis that um, the parameter for discussing and for coming to the conclusion what should be in it is the principle of essentiality. What is this principle of essentiality? This is a principle of law which you find in many countries, also now in the jurisprudence in the UK when it comes to Brexit and the division of powers and competences between government and parliament. It is a theory which also exists in EU law in the form of comitology and also in the US Constitution. And what does this say? It says everything which is essential 
because it either touches human rights, fundamental rights of individuals, or it is very important for the states, for, for a state, for example, the functioning of democracy, then these matters must be dealt with by law in a democracy, by the democratic legislator. So it is basically the criteria which tells us when does parliament need to act, or on the other hand, when can we leave something to the executive, or for that matter, to private parties. So this is the question we need to ask when we look at the question, what should be regulated in law, meaning with democratic legitimacy, which these ethics codes and self-regulation certainly don't have, and second, with the possibility of enforcement by public power, which also doesn't exist in relation to private, self-made, and self-imposed rules. So when you apply this cr criteria, essentiality, fundamental rights of individuals on the one hand, very important interests of the state on the other, for example, good functioning of democracy, what could be such issues? And I now uh, confine myself to some issues already highlighted in the ethics, um, high-level ethics group report, which was uh, presented uh, in April of this year. One example I would mention is that people need to know when they communicate with AI and not with a human being, whether this is spoken word or written word. Just imagine a democracy in which we don't have such a rule, in which we don't know anymore whether all the posts which say, Boris Johnson is a great guy, vote Boris Johnson, I will do it tomorrow, are actually <laughs> machine produced and we don't know that they're machine produced. We think these are all human beings. And wow, if so many people say this, maybe I should do it too. Democracy cannot function if we have such possibilities. So I believe, for example, we need a clear rule in law which obliges transparency on um, AI. We must know when we communicate with AI rather than a human being. And another question which poses itself um, is the question of explainability. In our constitutional order, under the rule of law, the principle is that any decision by the state can be reviewed by a judge. But a judge can only review decisions which have reasons, which are motivated. So when we are told that AI is so great and takes so good and right decisions, but it cannot explain how it got there and we should just accept it because this program is just so much better than anything we have seen before, we have a real problem maintaining the rule of law. Because if there's no motivation, if there's no explanation, how can a judge control decisions by the state which are taken by these programs in the future? And decisions will be taken, that's already very clear. Um, today already the legal order of some of our member states contain already empowerment clauses which say certain decisions by the administration can be automated. So uh, these are a number of issues which we are facing. On the explainability, to be very clear, the Commission already in its communication of April 2018 has said very clearly that we must have explainability. There's a lot of work going in this direction. And this is typically um, a case where I would say early regulation and clear statement by policymakers help orienting technology and investors in the right direction. And this has actually already happened since 2018, since our communication. The noise on it's not possible to explain it, you just have, has, have to accept it, has really reduced and it is good like that. So let us together maintain the achievement of enlightenment, the achievements of rule of law, democracy and fundamental rights, also in the age of artificial intelligence by putting down the rules for this purpose, which are binding and democratically legitimized. Thank you very much. Thank you.
So I will tell you a little bit about um, uh, the public policy program at the Alan Turing Institute um, and broaden it out to the kind of UK perspective. Um, I'm a political scientist, so in a different tribe from lots of you. Um, and I wrote my PhD back in the 1990s, just down the road at LSE, um, about information technology in government. Um, and in those days, that was a very sad and lonely thing to do. Um, no academics were interested in it. Um, and actually, policymakers and civil servants weren't interested in it either. They viewed technology very darkly as something, a sort of boring tool that was very easy to get wrong, and was better to steer away from and leave to the IT department. And consequently, the British government and also the American government um, and many other governments had a lot of problems with technology, a lot of failed projects, big cost overruns, very difficult relationships with um, computer services providers. And it was seen as kind of white, sort of a hidden world and slightly irrelevant um, world. And then along came the internet and everybody got a bit more interested in it. I had a better time at parties and everything. <laughs> and, 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 and then along came um, big data and artificial intelligence. Um, and, and now everybody's interested in it and, and we can fill a lecture theatre to talk about it um, with, with that topic and that, that's brilliant. Um, and it does touch everybody's lives. I mean, we're all dealing on a regular basis, many times a day, with large digital platforms based on artificial intelligence. It's touching every market. Every regulator has to deal um, with AI. So there's a kind of need, need and interest everywhere. But also, it's also true that in many ways, in government and in, in, to some extent in regulation, there's not so much of it about. Um, which caused, my, uh, uh, caused the uh, uh, Chief Executive of the Royal Statistical Society um, a few weeks ago to write an article in the Financial Times saying that AI in government um, was like teenage sex. Everybody was talking about it, um, but not so many people were actually doing it. And my, my, myself and my, my colleague, my deputy director, Cosmina Dorabanti, who wrote an article in Nature magazine about the um, program at the Turing called Rethink Government with AI. And it's, do read it if you're interested in this. Um, but we did have some problems agreeing the text with the editors because they kept saying, you haven't got enough exciting examples. Examples. You haven't mentioned autonomous vehicles. Where are the intelligent robots? And we have to say, well, it's not quite like that yet. And I think that is a challenge for, 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 for governments. It's something that must be confronted, and they are interested in it, but there's still you know, not so much of it about. So that was the idea of the public policy program at the Turing. I wanted um, government to have a better experience with this generation of technology than it has had with previous generations of digital technology. Um, we we um, called all over government, kind of talking to policymakers, asking them about the kind of things they were thinking about. And we found sort of two twin tracks of issues that policymakers were interested in across departments. And so about half were kind of technical issues, things that they thought they might be able to do with the technologies um, the, of, of data science and AI. Um, and the other were kind of ethical issues, um, a kind of fear of what you can do and what you can't do with data, what data you can use, um, and, 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 and how you should use the methodologies. So those are the kind of our aims. On the one hand, to help use um, data science to um, make public policy and government better. And on the other hand, to kind of tackle some of those ethical issues, which I'm sure lots of people here are, 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 are working on. First, with the tech, we've got around about 25 projects. UCL, there are many people from UCL at the Turing Institute, by the way. UCL, like Oxford, was one of the founding partners of the Turing Institute. Um, and there's sort of two things that AI, or at least machine learning um, and agent computing, can kind of do for government that government traditionally hasn't been very good at. One of them <coughs> is simulation. Um, AI allows very large, data-intensive, agent-based models where um, uh, uh, public policies can be simulated um, at a very high degree of complexity. 
where instead of uh, building a model, sort of toy model based just on functions and equations um, with very little data, you can actually model every car on every road, every piece of military equipment, every bullet and every soldier and so on. And that's, that's quite exciting. So, for example, we, we have a project um, modelling police demand, uh, uh, police resources. What's the effect of varying the levels of uh, police resourcing? Um, how will that affect the actual outcome of policing? If you can crack that question, um, you should be able to optimise the amount of resources you put into policing. And it's much better you can do it on a model without kind of hurting everyone. You can do it rather than just trying not having enough police, um, which is a strategy that has been used at various, various times. Um, and if you can crack that kind of modelling, then you can do it with, uh, in other policy areas like education or health. Um, and the other thing, of course, the other te key technology is machine learning which allows government to predict and forecast in all sorts of ways that it hasn't been able um, to do before. Um, government traditionally hasn't been very good at that. That's what machine learning is good for, identifying um, patterns in data and using that um, to uh, classify and predict um, behaviour of, of, of certain characters, at certain people or, or whatever. And that is a good segue into the question of ethics. Um, a, a, an example of a, a project that we're working on is, is, is the question of using these kind of predictive models in things like child welfare. Many local authorities in the UK are already using machine learning technologies to predict how many children um, will get taken into care, will need to be taken away from their families. Um, and local authorities want to do that, they will feel that they will be able to target resources more effectively um, and that there are gains to be had. But of course that's a deeply, deeply controversial area and it highlights one of the key ethical dilemmas of um, artificial intelligence in government. Because once you've predicted risk at an aggregate level, what happens at the individual level? Local authorities want to know which children are at risk. And then, what if you've got a probability of 90%? Do you put more resources into keeping that child where they are? Should you, should you take them away? These are really hard questions. What if the probability is 60%? That's even worse. What does that even mean? Should you pretend you don't know? In which case, why, why did you do it? And those kinds of models are being applied, as I'm sure you all know, to sentencing in many areas of the criminal justice system um, in some countries and will become much more common, um, as, as, as Paul was talking about. So there are very key ethical issues. Um, uh, we've, we've, we're quite we're proud of the fact that we have um, built a kind of ethical framework for using um, AI technologies in government. Um, uh, we built it um, working first of all um, with the Department of the Ministry of Justice and now have, 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 it's been published as a guide um, for the whole of government. Um, and we're quite proud of that because it's a kind of practical way. Um, it's got values and principles and a practical way that um, civil servants might kind of navigate this very complex um, and difficult area. Having said that, um, and moving on to the wider UK landscape, this is quite a crowded space. I'm sure everybody would agree. There can be no university that you come from that doesn't have a kind of centre for um, big data and data ethics and so on, or I'd be surprised. Um, in the UK government landscape, we have the Council for AI, which is overseeing sort of macro level policy on AI. Um, we have the Office of AI, which is um, uh, 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 leading from the, uh, uh, from business, uh, from the business facing um, department. Um, we have the Centre for Data Ethics and Innovation, um, which is kind of leading and, and may in fact become a statutory body, um, who knows, but that has been moved. We have the Government Digital Service, which is tackling some of the ethical uh, uh, issues of using data. We have the Department for Culture, Media and Sport, which has quite a, a role in the ethics area, is doing quite a, a bit on the ethics and produced the recent online harms. 
um, white paper. And then outside government, we have um, the Ada Lovelace Institute um, for, for um, data ethics and the relationship between data and society. Um, we have the Office of National Statistics that's also doing So it has become a very crowded area, and there are a lot of ethics frameworks about. And all the regulators are thinking about this issue. So I'll just end by mentioning two regulators um, that are particularly working in this area. I'm going to speak to some of the points that Paul was talking about. One is the, um, uh, is the Information Commissioner's Office, which has been very innovative in drawing together all the UK regulators and, and started an AI regulators working group identifying the sort of common issues and possibilities, which is a very positive move. And then the Electoral Commission, which I think is a bit at the other end of the spectrum, which is really struggling here to maintain the kind of fundamentals of democracy, the principle of being able to run free and fair elections, and I think really illustrates how we have to think um, for the future how we can incorporate these technologies, because every single political actor is in some way, if they use social media at all, using AI. Um, and therefore, the regulator must be able to build the capability to, to, to deal with it. So we need a lot of, I think, consolidation of convening people together and trying to, trying to kind of simplify some of these issues to tackle them. Thanks. Grant, would you like to come in? Sure, yes. Um, what, 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 what do I say about that? I would take a step back and say uh, we live on a planet uh, which is wonderful, um, <laughs> filled with wonderful humans uh, and lovely animals, and life scientists, so it's a human life. And AI itself has been around for quite a long time, you know, many decades. This isn't really anything new, this is just the latest flowering after the latest AI winter. And so taking a step back, um, AI therefore exists on a planet where we live. And so we have to think perhaps a little bit more about humans and the way in which we live or want to live and the way in which our societies are organised and the way in which we interact with each other and how AI and AI systems might complement rather than replace that. I think if we start thinking about that, that gives us a slightly different perception of how we design AI systems. So I might... Uh, take as an example medicine, I'm a doctor. Um, now the last time the British Medical Journal, uh, a journal that many doctors read, asked the question what makes a good doctor, uh, was uh, a couple of years before Facebook was born, in 2002. Uh, and they asked all their readers and they asked all their patients, um, and guess what came back, uh, apart from the basic, they're going to be competent of course. Um, what came back were words like compassion, uh, empathy, uh, integrity, you know, all those kind of words that now we start to think of, and I see lots of nods in the audience when we think about what we wish for ourselves or our loved ones, or indeed anyone in this audience when they encounter it. And so what should the place of AI in medicine? Should it be a hyper-diagnoser? No, I, I think it's about how do we enhance those human qualities in our societies, in our interactions, and how does the AI surround and control and take away those things, uh, giving like, the doctor or the health professional more time to care? Now why I say that is because I think thinking about where you're, where you're trying to end up is important in determining where you start. So having goes the example of, of risk prediction at the level of, of, of an individual child, um, which of course we would want to be able to predict in some sense if harm might come to an individual child and protect that. Who, who wouldn't? But the example you gave, if I understood it correctly, made clear that once you, if you actually start thinking about what would I do with a 60% prediction, it's the same as what would I do as a physician about a 60% prediction that, that this person is going to suffer some harm in the next 10 minutes. It's really difficult to know what to do about it. So why would I start developing a system like that if I don't know um, what to do at the end of it? I shouldn't. I can completely see the prediction at the level of the population to uh, aggregate resource but I can't see that prediction of the individual. So that's a very general statement, quite a long way from legal, but I hope brings the human back into the, into the loop and thinking about the use case that we decide. 
And, and then my final point, perhaps, is just to pick up uh, a little bit on what Paul said, uh, and in particular the issue of uh, explainability, which I think is very important, and I share those sentiments, but it deserves, again, a bit of consideration from the uh, human nature. So I'm a psychologist, and I've I'm, I'm been a doctor, um, and so I regularly encounter uh, black boxes called doctors um, <laughs> who um, sit to pick up patient clinics and dispense advice on the basis of inputs. So they take in a lot of interesting data um, from all sorts of sources, it's very high dimensional, and they synthesize it and they give out an opinion like, I think you should have surgery. And the explainability, <laughs> what determines the explainability of that particular answer? Just think yourself into that situation. It's actually quite, quite hard to, well, it's, it's not hard to sort of think yourself into the situation and think, well, perhaps I can then ask that health professional, well, why do you recommend that? And if the doctor comes up with interesting answers, like I recommend that because I think you need this and I think you need that, then you say, oh, I trust that individual. Uh, and, and then that leads to this idea of trust between two humans, um, which leads you to be reassured and saying, yeah, I, I think I'll go for it, or turn to the other way, where you say, no, 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 hang on a sec, I'll get a second opinion, thank you very much. So, uh, one more point to make about humans. When the doctor makes that explanation, one might hope that explanation is extremely rational and based on the ability of humans to introspect incredibly accurately about their reasons for a decision and to tell you incredibly accurately how they came to that decision. Um, I'm sorry, but as a psychologist, I can tell you humans are not very good at that. Um, maybe the example to think about is think about a complex decision you made. Maybe you've rented a, an apartment or bought a house. That's quite a complicated decision. Can you actually explain why you did it? Well, yeah, you can make up a just-so story about that. Like, uh, this. But the reality is you sort of walk in and say, well, I love this, or no, I don't like this, or you know, there, there's more to making decisions. So we know from lots of psychology and neuroscience that humans, who are these prototypical explainers, find great difficulty in actually explaining their own actions and why they did those things. I don't think that matters because, of course, we have a functioning society. Um, full of legal professionals and health professionals and people we trust on a daily basis. And indeed, many of us have got here on forms of transport that we trust, uh, and a crash, burner, exploded fire, but which of course then comes from the regulation and law that surrounds that, that thing. So, so I'm a sort of optimist, I, I, but I think when we think about explainability in XAR, as the area was talking about, we need to again think about how we judge that a human sitting next to us is explainable and, and start to think about how to apply those standards to the AI ra rather than some higher standard of hyper rationality. Um, I think I'll leave it there. Okay. Thanks. Uh, well, thanks for having us here. I, I, uh, there's a million things I could say. Uh, I, I started out thinking I should be uh, talking about the speakers, but all three of the things that have already been said have been really interesting, so I also feel obliged to add a little bit. I think I'll, I'll come back and, and start out actually talking a little bit about uh, some of the comments Paul made, um, because I really appreciate the work he's doing at the EU, and, and I'm, I'm actually a big fan of him on Twitter. Although he tweets too much even for me, I, I can't keep on the uh, um, But the, I, 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 so therefore I think it's worth sort of addressing some of the co concerns. Um, you said uh, right at the beginning that AI is being sort of overused just for marketing. But one of the things that really, really worries me is some of the big tech pretending that, that it, it hasn't been using AI for the last 21 years. Anyone guess which? I'm talking about, but rather that it's only been using it for two years, uh, so, and, and saying that basically AI equals machine learning. Um, I, I, I think there are people that are now <laughs> pretending not to use AI in order to try to avoid these regulations. And we also saw this in the high level experts group um, when there were certain lines which I think got ripped out eventually, but in the draft that said uh, sufficiently complex systems, right? If anyone puts in weasel words like that, they're trying to evade uh, a, a regulation. So I actually, uh, coming back to something that Margaret said, I, I, Helen, sorry, Helen, I'm uh, sorry, Helen said, uh, I actually was using AI and the internet in the 80s when I was a psychology major. 
Um, and, and now I've forgotten why I said that because I want to, what was I just talking about before? The, the, uh, the com <laughs> companies kind of saying they're not using it when they are using oh, it. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, the, um, I don't know where I was going with that. Sorry, <laughs> I'll come back to that. The, the, um, what did you, why, why did I want to go there? Oh, well, I, I can't remember. Let, let's just go quickly to this. Um, I want to say, as a developer, how many people here are developers, AI developers, are sort of worried about all this regulation stuff? Oh, not very many. Okay, not what I'm talking about. No, <laughs> seriously. Um, if you were a developer, if your friends are developers, uh, a lot of people in tech. Oh, yeah. <laughs> anyway, a lot of people in tech are uh, very concerned about this and are trying to evade in the ways like I was just describing. Uh, they said GDPR would be a disaster. Then it happened. They said, oh, this is great. We can talk to 28 countries uh, much more easily now. We can do business here, and other people are joining it. And then they still try to interfere with the next process. It's like they think regulation must be a bad thing, and they can't function in a different way. No, regulation is like the operating system. It's like you want to have a good operating system that you can pass stuff to that's not really your core business. You want to be able to have people helping you to have uh, to compete honestly and to be able to do uh, the sensible things and not have to constantly be watching your own uh, back and watching your, your competitors and everything. You don't want to be the police yourself. So, so we, we should think about all these regulations as ways that we can do better and we can get more involved uh, with, with the society. Anyway, um, I don't know how much to talk about this nitty gritty kind of things like that. The British actually uh, have, ha I, I actually, I do have questions I want to ask Paul. I often say I think that the British are right now leading all these uh, regulatory bodies you're talking about. The EU actually said every nation should have regulatory bodies, and then we got a bunch of regulatory bodies and said, haven't we had a great idea? Um, but actually, I do think we are leading in this. Both the May and the Johnson government seem to think that that AI will be the magic goose thing that will give us golden eggs sufficient to, to dig out of the hole of Brexit, right? So they, I, the, Johnson spent his entire UN, UN speech on this. May talked about this at Davos uh, two years ago, and then sent somebody else to talk about it this year. Um, so, so there's, uh, but I do think we are leading partly because they have been pouring so many resources. And, and, I, and I decline that there's every single country, every single university has a data ethics. Maybe they own something, but we're the only ones. Bath is the only ones with the CDT entirely <laughs> dedicated to accountable and transparent AI. So that, that's, yeah, so, so give us some credit here. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm defensive. I'm from the provinces. I'm not from this, the big city here. Um, one thing that we, ha uh, I, I totally want to support, uh, oh, something great to say, about explainability, uh, that, um, that, that it, it has been an issue for, for uh, a long time, but, and, and um, there's lots of different ways to do explanation. One of the, the things I think is most important is making sure that we explain how did we get here. Software is written. Oh, that's where I was trying to go before. Let's not even talk about whether it's AI or not. Let's talk about we have a good way to, to, to uh, build software where we keep track of whether we did the right things, how did we test it, when were we sure it was done, we have our stuff cyber, cyber secure, we know like if anyone else has gotten into our code base. You know, it's just like running a bank in a way. I mean, it's not exactly like running a bank, but you don't go to a bank and say, uh, you know, like, what are the neurons doing in your, in your bankers, right? You say, show us the accounts, show us that you tracked the process correctly. And we get some kind of explanation out of AI systems that same way. If we could say, how did you know it was ready to release? Did you follow due practice? Did you practice due diligence? And my understanding from having talked to the British government a lot in the last few years is that most of them think we don't really need massive new laws. We just need to enforce the standard regulations on people that, that release uh, commercial products. But we do need re new regulatory bodies that can check whether they did do due diligence on the software development, because that isn't an area of expertise that had currently been existing in the government. So, so basically, and, and when I've talked about this in some contexts, again, there's only one developer here, but believe me, some places where you are, there, I, I don't know, there are there bankers or insurers here? That's what you often get in London. And they're like drooling, they're like, ooh, something else to audit, right? But yes, this is something you can audit. And, and that, that Britain can provide services to help make sure that we're doing a good job. Um, 
I want to I want to go somewhere that none of the other uh, speakers went now, and 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 uh, I, I don't want to, I don't want to take too long to turn. But we haven't really talked about the economy too much, so I do want to say briefly, uh, if you're if those people that well that half of you that were afraid, I, well I'm afraid too actually, <laughs> but, but I will say, you know it's not that robots are going to take all the jobs. First of all, robots don't do things. People do things with robots. So companies decide whether to fully automate part of their business process, and then governments decide whether or not to say, hey, you fully automated your uh, business process. Congratulations. You no longer have liability for that anymore, as the European Parliament unfortunately briefly proposed, but has apparently been shut down with the idea of, of having AI itself uh, uh, being a legal person. Um, so anyway. The, the, uh, if I, as a programmer, as someone in the AI uh, department for another few months, uh, decided to build uh, 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 or, or managed to, it was inspired to build something that made teachers twice as effective, nothing in the fact that I built that software tells us whether our kids get twice as good of education or that our taxpayers pay half as much for teachers, right? So employment is much more about uh, about political decisions, about redistribution, and, um, and about inequality. And I think we can't uh, ignore the UN reports on the state of the UK and the incredible, as I mentioned, I'm not, I'm not, I was somewhat not joking about the provinces being left behind. That, you know, that the UN has said, look at you guys, you look like you're the Middle East, you, know, you look like a country with oil and not Norway. Right, you, you, you're, 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 all the, the resources are all getting captured in London, and it's not getting distributed. And you know, I have friends in, in Wales that are saying that their kids are only going to school three and a half days a week now. You know, this is nuts. How could this be happening in our country? Right. So that so um, I I'm working on this. I think part of what happens is, and this isn't necessarily AI, although AI can contribute to it by making people more exchangeable and driving wages down because we can all get skills more quickly using like GPS, you know, so we're all Uber drivers now instead of having these incredibly trained uh, London taxi drivers, right? So that, that is a way that AI can affect things directly. But ICT in general means that there can be single winners um, and that those winners can sell all over the whole world and we need to get on top of redistributing that. And the EU was, has proposed something which is called this digital tax. Um, but it was blocked by, we, we need to rewrite the EU. <laughs> it, it was blocked by Luxembourg and Ireland because they had so much investment from some of those people that would get taxed. Um, however, I don't think this is just about digital. I think this is about transnational uh, corporations in general and, and, and that actually the people who are digital transnationals are the most aligned with the interests of uh, liberal democracies because they want to see lots of people that all have good education and enough food and, and money in their pockets. They, they make money off of micropayments. So I think we have uh, issues of transnational organization need to get on top of, and the AI is just, it's like the spotted owl, it's cute, people identify with it, but there's a bigger, broader problem that it's just sort of the poster child of. I probably talk too much, a lot of people Not, a, not at all. Sense, <laughs> Does anyone from the panel want to come back on any of the points that were made before we open up to the audience? I'm just going to say one thing that interests me is no one's talked about the learning aspects of, of algorithms because it seems to be one of the fundamental advances at the moment is we have algorithms that have been developed that can be released into the wild that learn. So in the medical sphere, we have an algorithm that might predict a diagnosis or a treatment that when it is deployed can continue to accrue data and it can continue to learn and change. And it strikes me that's a fundamental issue that's a little bit different to how we've thought about um, algorithms in the past for this deployable and I'd raises be, regulatory issues. I'd be very happy to talk about that very quickly in, in response. That is a good point. Um, if, if you allow something to continue running, and again, so one of the things I believe is that if we do hold companies accountable for their products, then they are going to get more transparent. They're going to care about the explanations so they can demonstrate that they follow due, due diligence and good practice. It isn't really like you're just releasing it out there like a virus or something like, a, like these, uh, these hacked, uh, 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 yeah. It, it is that um, 
you, when you release software, I mean, like Facebook actually uh, self modifies all the time. They allow they allow their programmers to keep hacking on the code, and then it goes. There's constant tests that are being run. So if you have something, again, you have to say, you have to demonstrate that you had good ways of knowing that the system was still working well, and that you have good reason to believe it's still working well. So you sort of have to have guardrails on it if you if you let it if you let it out in the wild and it's still learning that you should still be running those same checks that you were running before you certified it for release. Um, so, so it's a, it's sort of, a, the, a, again, a situation we have already. So I agree, I agree with that just as a brief comeback to the general framework. Yeah. In, in a domain like medicine, we don't currently have the regulation framework that provides those regulations. So, yeah. so, so we, so we made this work on that. We have, yeah. not, we, we have a regulation system that qualifies uh, the system for release if it's safe. Um, but its efficacy is something that's just a little bit more um, optional, and, and it's the efficacy changing that we're concerned about. Okay, so that sounds like you would want legislation on that to keep checking that piece to, to maintain, to maintain uh, intelligent, to intelligent regulation. But that's a, I'm just raising that as an interesting topic. Yeah, I think on the learning aspect, we should not be, uh, let's say, um, alarmistic because right now it's very difficult to train uh, these machines. And let's say the simplistic idea that is, you know, just need a great machine learning algorithm and you just throw enough math books before the algorithm and then the algorithm will come up uh, with the relativity theory of Einstein. It doesn't work like that. I mean, certainly you need a third element, which is you must know the domain in which you're working and all this is very slow and often, I must say, I've been very disappointed, uh, you know, with a great program which supposedly works so great and you try it out and mm, it's, it's really not so great. <laughs> but in the highest ranks of some of the big global corporations which dominate in terms of number of thousands of researchers and billions of euros which they throw at AI, in the highest ranks there are some people who are, you know, friends of singularity, Ray Kurzweil, uh, in Google, who have ideas about overcoming, uh, you know, the human uploading uh, humanity uh, on the hard disk, and uh, they have completely other ideas about learning. If you listen to them, then what Nick Bostrom, the philosopher from Sweden who teaches in Oxford, said that this could be our last invention. These programs, which are in the fantasies of these singularity people, uh, you know, then this becomes something you know we have to figure it with a little bit. Because it's not completely harmless that these corporations, which are number one, two, three, four, and five of the stock exchange, have such people who consciously aim for such a technology, which is called general artificial intelligence, which then would set its own purposes. It would not just learn in the narrow specific area of search or whatever, but it would transfer learning from one area to the other, and so on. They aim for this. They want this. And um, I would say, you know, these corporations have become powerful enough to talk about this, to make this part of the discourse, and to make sure that we have a number of tools, you know, the off switch, uh, uh, which is uh, sort of also legally sound, that if really something goes in this direction, uh, you, you can intervene. I think there are fantasies, there are, we have a lot of psychologists on the table here, there are a little bit infantilist, absolute power fantasies uh, in the uh, internet world and in Silicon Valley. And these fantasies, in parts, are totally anti-democratic. And they go very, very far, you know, collecting the human brain to the internet, controlling the whole world as a system. Norbert Wiener, yeah, Kubernetes, it's all about Kubernetes. We can control it all. You know, got to be a little bit careful. It's not completely harmless, the concepts behind this. Yeah. Can I of course, yeah. Quickly on this, uh, too? I, I, I want to totally agree that I love the way you said that. that there's several things I've never heard before this evening. So again, my compliments to the, to the panel. But uh, that it isn't, the singularity itself isn't the problem. The people believing in the singularity are the problem. And I think that um, you know this kind of insanity. I think we've seen it before. I mean, this whole idea that uh, why did we think that the kings were gods, right? It's like they have so much power that their life has gone nonlinear, and then they start believing these bizarre things. Um, I, I think that uh, it's it's important uh, to realize that 
Um, well, the, by, what, when I have to debate Boston, which I do every so often, uh, what I say is the singularity actually already happened 10,000 years ago. All the things that he talks about in terms of, uh, you know, you have this exponential increase of an exponential, and, and then you have these unintended consequences, that describes human society. Since we had writing, you could say writing was the first AI. Okay, so the macaques were beating us. As hominids were interesting, we were getting around to a lot of continents, but the macaques were beating us. The monkeys have evolved more recently than the apes, and then some of the hominids got writing. And in 10,000 years, it is an exponential on exponential uh, of, of our population. Now our biggest problem is sustainability, obviously. You know, the, the biggest problem is the environment. Um, the, so, so, and the, uh, yeah, and that's an unintended side effect too. So, so I think that these, the people who want to believe that this is it, and I run into these people, I get called up to be on these panels, I don't know if you guys do too, <laughs> but they, they seriously tell me like, you know, you guys don't even know what you're talking about, I'm sitting in the rooms of the people who do, in 10 years we're gonna have energy independence, no one is gonna, in this room is likely to die ever, and you're just like, what world are you living in? You know, this is, this is a terrible set of very important, important, strong, influential, rich people that are believing terrible things. You know, the 20th century had 120 mass killings in it. And, and uh, not just the three you usually hear about. It, it, it was a, there was a lot of that. And now we're watching a couple of uh, other states of millions of people that are being cut off from their surroundings, which is a good predecessor for genocide. And, and we're watching it, it's on Twitter. We can look at it every day if we want to, right? But the, but the um, what I worry about is these people that don't, they're saying, well, that, all that stuff is okay, because actually machines are better than we are anyway, you know? And, you're, and it sounds like a Doctor Who plot, and yet these are people sitting in the same room with you. You're, it's just astounding. Um, anyway, so I really think what we need to do is reduce uh, inequality. I do think part of the problem is it's just way too much uh, power in individuals. We have to get on top of the wealth tax ideas in, in individuals and companies. We need to just balance things out and I think we'll get more lucid. Uh, p political polarization is, is directly correlated to uh, wealth inequality. And nobody knows why. We only know that empirically. But I, you know, if we could get on top of basic governance, then maybe we could help uh, reduce the threat these people pose. I will throw one related threat, though, which is with all the machine learning and with our capacity to explain and understand each other. You and, you and I, uh, I, you are a biologist. I'm someone who dabbles in biology. Um, yeah, we, we may be happy talking about humans as more or less, life is more or less algorithmic, humans is more or less algorithmic, and then say, OK, that, that's it. We are sort of apes that have this really cool compute abil ability. I don't know if you're really happy. I'm happy to say that. Some people are extremely unhappy with this. So to me, the real existential threat of AI is that what are people for? When we see all these things that set us aside from the other animals, that we just think we could eat the other animals, and we see them in machines, we start feeling deeply threatened about what is it, it is about us. And I think that this puts us in denial about the extent to which we can be predicted, that we could be nudged with our democracies. You know, people come in and say, uh, I don't care if Russians you know, told me to vote for Trump. Um, it's my opinion now. This, I don't care who paid for the ad where I first saw this. I don't even remember if that is the first time I saw it, but I don't care. And people are very unhappy if, if uh, yeah, well anyway, so the point is that, that we need to get on top of how we work too, and we will, and that there's a humanities question here is how will we process this information? Will we reject it like some people reject climate change? Thank you. Um, so these have been really fascinating talks by everyone. And um, we're going to open it up now to audience questions. So so yeah, we, we've got two roving mics coming around, one on each aisle. So just um, we'll take a, a handful of questions at a time and just say your name and if you want your affiliation. So um, we have a lady on the, in the middle there. Hi, my name's Amy. I'm working in medical technology in a startup in London. I have a question for the panel, but maybe specifically for Joanna, because you mentioned this. Um, I think 
The point that was made around the saturation of business ethic frameworks, I think, is really interesting. Within the medical technology space, I think there's a lot of uh, artificial intelligence that's deployed already within, for example, NHS hospitals, and there is a lot of regulation of um, those deployments. What do you see to be the future of being able to regulate the startup community in addition to big tech? Because currently there is a bit of saturation of frameworks. Well, you asked me, but I think that my colleagues may have better answers uh -huh. to that. I'm, I'm not as good okay, as well. we'll we'll just take a, a couple more, and then we'll go back to the panel. Um, okay. So the <laughs> the lady at the top there in the middle. Hi, my name is Anna. Um, I would like to ask you a question about the military use of AI. I think you might heard that the U.S. is trying to merge the drones with AI to choose the targets by itself. Uh, so what do you think about uh, how ethical it could be, uh, what could happen if someone, if it will end up in the wrong hands, this technology? Thank you. Thank you. And um, the man at the, at the very top in the middle? Hi there. Good. It's <laughs> a good one. Good one. Yeah, my name's Adam. Um, thank you for the speaking this evening. I found it very engaging. I don't want to say I, I do agree with everything you've said, but my I apologize in advance for my question. It's going to repeat the same word a lot and might be a little meta. I do work for one of the regulators. Um, I'm here independently. Um, my question is. In the, in the future of artificial intelligence, ethics, policy, regulation. You know, you want to get a lot of diverse people at the table setting the discussion going forward. And my question is, how do we determine the people at the table's ethics is more ethical than, say, my ethics? You know, how do we get, how do we quantify, how do we qualify that going forward if we're going to be shaping AI going forward. It's, it's not good, it's not bad. I think if anyone ever said it's a silver bullet, they would be laughed off the, off the stage. But it's more of just a mirror showing more of who we are back at ourselves, both good and bad. And if we're going to be determining the ethics of what we are as a species reflecting back at ourselves, how do we determine whose ethics is more ethical? So that's my <laughs> Thank you. Um, so three great questions, one on um, regulating med tech, one on um, military use of AI, especially uh, autonomous drones, and one on who gets to decide what ethical um, principles underpin our AI regulation. So whoever wants to go first. Well, OK, I, I can start. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. So, on the military side, um, there are, of course, talks in the United Nations uh, on this. There's just now this new initiative on multilateralism, meaning you know, many countries doing things together, 50 states and the UN General Assembly uh, uh, last week and this week signed up to this. And one of the goals is indeed to regulate and partially ban um, these, um, uh, these mixes of technology. We have banned uh, bioweapons and landmines in a multilateral agreement for one simple reason. They are out of control of the human once they are put into the field. And so if AI is the same, namely you have this autonomous uh, drone, uh, you know, the same principle applies. The, the rules of war should not allow uh, uh, weapons which are out of control of the humans after they put out into the field. So there is um, a structured process going on, and there are NGOs, uh, you know, ban killer robots you can engage in, and, you know, if you're interested in this, you should engage. And, uh, you know, foreign ministers and foreign offices uh, are working on this, and uh, it's a difficult process, but I would say it's worth pushing. Uh, on this question, and I think this is a very important question, the ethics, the word is overused in this context. Uh, I personally think this has been financed in a great ploy by Silicon Valley. A lot of money has been put into this. Suddenly we all talk about ethics and not law anymore. Before, the technology regulation was always law. And what is the advantage of ethics for those guys? It is not binding. And, you know, everybody chooses their own ethics. And like Google, you know, if you don't feel like it anymore, you just dissolve after a few days your ethics board. 
you know, too troubling. <laughs> so um, the answer to your question is exactly. In democracy, because somebody carries the title of lawyer or ethics professor, it doesn't give you two, ten, or fifty votes. It gives you one vote like everybody else. So I would say, you know, let's stick to the usual process of democracy, and every argument is worth what it is. Every argument must be tested as to its value, but the fact that somebody says, I here now talk about ethics and I'm an ethicist, doesn't give any more legitimacy than somebody who says, and I'm an economist, and I'm a psychologist, and I'm a lawyer. So um, I think it is an effort to avoid law. And I would say, you know, if it's true that we live in a crisis of democracy, and many books are written about this in America and in Europe too, then let's use the instruments of democracy rather than uh, trying to evade them. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to make two points which kind of wrap a few things that people have said together. I mean, I do think that, and it partly goes back to your doctor point, I mean, yes, doctors aren't very transparent. And I think what technology quite often does is reveal how things work. There's a lot of talk, which I'm sure most people here know about, about kind of bias in machine learning. Um, and the fact that um, uh, decisions that uh, decision support systems based on machine learning um, can be racist and can be sexist and so on because they're based on training data which comes from human systems which are um, uh, uh, which are biased. So hiring algorithms and Amazon recently abandoned their hiring algorithm which they were developing to be less biased. Um, in gender terms when they um, employed um, data scientists because they couldn't get it working because all their training data was, was, was biased and the older the data is, the more biased it is so it can actually make things worse. But if you think about it, and then we blame, we blame the machine learning but actually what we're doing here is revealing bias in our human systems. Judges are, are known to be biased, a biased kind of group in certain ways. Um, and we've, we've not really had the data to measure it before. We haven't been able to kind of quite put our finger on it. As machine learning technologies have made that quite explicit. Um, so I suppose I'm trying to inject a sort of positive note here that actually if, if we can tackle that problem, we will perhaps make our kind of social and political systems more fair than they ever were before, if we can kind of use the technology to make things explicit. And that does apply a bit to the defence example. I mean, at the Turing, for example, we have a defence and security partnership which works with defence and security agencies. And they recently um, appointed um, an ethics, um, or in the process of appointing an ethics, uh, uh, an ethics fellow. Um, sorry, Paul. Um, but <laughs> you know, I see that as positive because did we used to talk about defence ethics? Are we actually talking about things that we didn't used to talk about before? Um, so, so that's one thing. The question um, about uh, who decides on the ethics, I do disagree with you a, a, a bit here, and here's why. Um, because, and again, I suppose it's slightly related to the other point. Um, we do have to kind of make some decisions here when we're thinking about these things. We, one of the projects that is uh, kind of my own project, I'm the principal investigator, um, that we're working on is hate speech, how to classify um, hate speech, how to predict it, how to counter it, how to measure it. And I was presenting this to a conference recently of mostly sort of more technical people, sort of computer scientists and, um, uh, and, and uh, complex systems people and mathematicians and so on. And one of the discussants was saying, well, it, it, you know, when you talk about that, when you talk about measuring hate, you're talking about kind of, you're saying it's hate. Um, you're saying something other than it's illegal. You're saying it's hate. And that's a normative thing. And he said it with an expression as if, you know, I kind of put some wet fish on the table, some dead fish on the table. You know, it's normative. So it's not science. And I think that's a really important point because actually I think here 
the ethics, and I, I do think it's important that some ethical, the sort of development of these ethical principles is part of the, of the science, as part of the development. It's not something you do afterwards or sign a form before or get ethical clearance, you can do anything you like, or afterwards you say, oh well, there's an ethical framework which fits this. It's something we have to build into the technology. So, yeah, I, I do. It goes wider than what 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 what, what, what is illegal. The issues are wider than legality. So I think, and I think we need philosophers. Big shortage of philosophers at the moment. I don't know. Are there any philosophers here? Um, well, <laughs> <I'm> because, this <laughs> well, because I mean, we've got three or four philosophers on our team, and recruiting the right people to do this kind of work is, is challenging. Uh, okay, so Graham, I'm just going to go next on the basis of the fact that I wrote that bias paper. <laughs> that, that was the, the, um, but I don't want to talk about that. I want to talk about being one of the people on the on the Google ATF board. <laughs> I actually, um, the, I want to. I, I also want to disagree with this point about ethics. I do agree that the a lot of companies are trying to evade regulation, as I said before. Um, and I, but look, the the first. Uh, the first of these sets of principles that we've all been seeing was British. It was the principles of robotics that came out in 2011. It was written in 2010. It was also at that meeting. Um, it was enormously controversial, the idea that you should have transparency. There was an entire meeting on its fifth anniversary of people trying to overturn that. And we got a few of the people who were original authors there, and we turned the room. They said, oh yeah, we need that. They, because People wanted AI, you know, like we were just saying, these sick people in Silicon Valley. Well, the British people like that have been convinced otherwise, right? They really wanted AI to be their, their eternal perfect babies, which is a misunderstanding of the nature of computation, and, 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 and it isn't the and, and biology. <laughs> anyway, so they didn't like this idea that we had to make sure that people could see the machine nature of AI, that they knew if they were talking to AI or not. All that stuff was radical. Now the OECD uh, principles, which look strikingly like the British principles, with some really great additions, but but you could you can look at it uh, to it, um, are are have been signed up to by 42 countries, uh, and and uh, you said before that, that it wasn't democratic, but it's about it's democratic like the EU is that the that the, 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 the companies the countries of the OECD the 20 countries of the OECD sent. Uh, sent two representatives each. So the original, that was actually sort of done uh, by national representatives. And then the, our elected leaders. And not only the OECD plus, plus France, but the G20 has signed up to those principles. Now, the OECD, you know, they helped us craft our data protection rules, you know, starting from principles years ago. And now they're working on helping us uh, craft our regulatory rules. So I do think that getting people to agree about you know, in that case, it was transparency, it's human centeredness that we're not trying to, again, create these animals that will take over the world from us uh, out, of, out, of, out of metal, but rather that we're trying to sustain uh, life, including humans on the planet. Uh, that, those were things we had to argue about. And, and we still have to argue. I have literally, unfortunately, at the World Economic Forum, seen people say, oh, we've all agreed it has to be human centered AI. That means that robots need to look like people. And so, no, <laughs> that was not why we spent all that time arguing that through. So people are still assaulting these agreements, but um, but I think it's important that we have you know principles we can agree to that we can police, and then laws to to help us police them. Correct, Craig, and you could say something about the medical technology as well. Can I say something? Yeah, 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 please. So I think the the, the premise was that AI systems are being deployed in our health service as we, as we speak. Um, I, I think I'd, I'd nuance that by reminding everyone that, that our glorious National Health Service uh, is uh, the world's largest purchaser of fax machines. <laughs> just to, just to sort of remind you that, um, it, might not be, it might not be quite as uh, sophisticated as we say. Um, the, your question, I think, was about, about the regulatory framework and whether it's adequate. And, and I want to make two points. One is I think uh, the devices, uh, regulations, and framework in this country is pretty good in terms of ensuring whatever's put in front of you is safe and won't do any harm. And so I think that, that creates an environment that one can be confident in, in terms of whatever these algorithms or devices that are to be uh, 
uh, deployed once the fax machines have, have stopped um, working are going to be. Um, wh where we're perhaps a bit further behind is in thinking about the opportunity that the regulatory framework creates to enable uh, more exciting and, and, and helpful kind of devices like the learning machines I've talked about. And I think we're a little bit hampered in, in the UK by the fact our regulatory framework in this area is, is fractured across multiple organisations, MHRA, CQC, um, it, it doesn't really matter what the acronyms are, you don't know what they are, uh, and, and the ICA. Um, but there are positive signs because each of those are engaging uh, and are talking with experts and are attempting to develop that framework. Talking to each other. Yeah, and so I, I think that's a positive sign. The final point I'll make is what's kind of interesting about the health space is that there's an increasing uh, tendency, I can observe, of many of the multinational companies to try and go direct to consumers, uh, to market health devices that are on the wrist or in the pocket or somehow like that. And I think we need to think quite, quite carefully about that, not because it's necessarily a bad thing or, or a dangerous thing, but it creates different um, interactions between individuals out there in the community and their healthcare professionals and could in fact drive demand um, for healthcare that we can't afford rather than, as it were, correct inequality because those devices are often purchased by people who have the money uh, to afford them. Going back to Joanna's uh, 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 point, and I'll, I'll shut up and go back. There's just one final point if I can remember it, um, which I can't, so I'll go back to. Okay, well, then I'll bounce back again. I have something I definitely want to pass back to Paul, but let me first say about the Fitbits. When I come home and my husband's wearing one, I make him take it off. I don't want other people to know about my activities based on his heart rate. <laughs> and there are American health, sorry, there's, yeah, there's, there, there's, there's American health care uh, 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 providers, uh, insurance providers, that are now requiring that they get that kind of information about you. So this is another kind of social control we, I am terrified of, personally. I really don't want that. But I forgot to say, I wanted, I said I'd say something about ATF. I think your question may have come partly out of the Google tried to create a diverse panel. They really tried. And then they got infinite flack for having too diverse of a panel because somebody was on the right, oh no. And, and there was this huge platforming. Um, you know, there's a, oh, it's called platforming, not like Uber. It's like that you can't let evil people have a voice. Well, this, this evil person was working for, yes, it's a right-wing think tank. I am not right-wing myself. I wouldn't probably want to invite her to a party or something. But, but the point was that she was, first of all, the people I know who know more about politics than I do couldn't believe that there was an African-American or a woman that was the head of heritage. But secondly, they were already working with the left-wing Pelosi's office on, on the assault on our democracy, the, the, the digital assault. So they were already collaborating across the aisle. This was a group, and they've written tech policy. This is a real problem. This is the one I wanted to pass to Paul. Because how do you get people to say, yes, we have to work across the aisle? And how do you get people to accept that? I mean, what Facebook has done, I don't know if you've seen this, They've set up their well, ethics panel now, and they've just basically I, I think gone inside out of what Google did. Well. They ran all over the world, and they got these pooled things, and then they got like social scientists to watch them do these pooled things, and people feed in all these ideas and whatever, and that helped them set up a panel. And I don't know again how much that's ethics watching or just creating by and people talk say that about democracy too, right? But but it's something that uh, that they've done, and so I you know good luck to them. I hope I hope they do better. Than um, Paul, just hold, hold those thoughts so I can take another round of questions um, from, from the panel. <laughs> so, we have um, the lady at the front down here. Oh boy, it's like the school band. <laughs> Hello, thank you for the very interesting <laughs> panel. My name is Francesca Mazzi, I'm a researcher and PhD student at uh, Queen Mary University of London. I'm studying AI from the uh, legal perspective. I have only a legal background, but I'm studying it in relation to the pharmaceutical uh, companies and from the uh, patent perspective. Uh, apart from that, also from the perspective of uh, data protection. So my question is about um, the explainability. The, the topic has been uh, touched upon uh, by the panel, but I would like to ask you um, 
I mean, in light of the combination of the articles of the GDPR um, 13, 15, and 22, like right of access, um, right uh, uh, of um, not being uh, um, under the uh, solely automated decision-making processes, like all this combination of articles seem to suggest the that there must be a sort of readability of the algorithm. Um, so uh, what, I, what I'm wondering is when it comes to health, um, you need to, I mean, if you, from my understanding, I'm not, again, a technician, but when you have a lot of data and you don't have a prediction of how the algorithm works, you get the best outcomes. But uh, you might risk these uh, biases that we have been discussing uh, before, this discrimination effect. So uh, what could be the best solution to have the maximum result for patients and uh, protecting the privacy at the same time and the guarantees okay. for the people? Thank, thank, you very, you. thank you very much. Um, we've got the gentleman at the front here. There's another mic coming. Hello, my name is Andre. I actually work for one of the big corporations, so in the telecom industry. So I have uh, two que uh, one question, an example, and another question for you. Okay, we so, don't have too much time, so please yeah. try yeah, keep it as brief as possible. Sure. So the first one is quite simple. If you can give us some specific examples of positive, ethical, and empowering uses of AI. So something that you are very proud of in the industry using AI. Second, I want to give an example. We are using machine learning and early alert systems to predict disasters. And we are using AI to send ambulances to hotspots and then have connectivity between the ambulances and the hospitals. The question is, should AI provide proactive uh, support and should we sacrifice some of our privacy and data for health or security benefits. Thank you. And um, the woman just at the front here. Hi, uh, my name is Adina and uh, Looking at um, what you've discussed today and also my own research in the field, it seems to me that we are actually mixing up and talking at all times about a very complex um, uh, landscape. And I would say, for instance, that we are looking on the one hand to the providers of data, which I would call individuals or consumers. We are also talking about data collectors or harvesters, the companies who actually collect data and then sell it on to whoever needs to have it. We are also looking at platform providers, um, you know, who publish information and data. And we are also looking at the technical people who actually develop that. Now, what it seems to me is that all of them need philosophy, ethics, because it goes, it goes hand in hand. Uh, it needs a light touch and it needs regulation and legislation in various degrees. And what I have noticed is that actually I'm not quite sure in the end whether what we are working on cover the whole field of these different domains, which in my view may need different types of approaches. And this is what makes the whole issue of ethics very, very complex is that, you know, human rights, yes, human rights for whom, or uh, other rights, or patients' rights, or data rights, or, they need to be somehow sliced and organized by all these domains which are different. You know, me, my rights as a, as a source of data that can be used could be different, and I may need to be regulated in a different way than a data harvesting company, etc. So. Uh, is there any clarity about these domains that are involved and the differences in regulation, um, legislation, or soft touch, uh, or whatever, that need to apply in every category? It seems to me that we are not thinking in this kind of organized structure. Thank you. And we've got time for one more question. Um, who wants to come up with a quick one, the last one? And um, woman in the middle there. Uh, 
Uh, hi, uh, my name is Aneta. I study social policy research at LSE. Can you not hear me? No. Um, so I wanted to ask if you think AI can be used to reduce inequality. So somewhat related question. Thank you very much. Um, who wants to kick things off? I'll go first this time. And <laughs> so to the end. I just want to, I can't answer all the questions, but I want to say uh, quickly, I strongly agree about, well, actually I'm, I'm concerned about this issue, about uh, the way that some people are interpreting the current GDPR, and perhaps it's what it was the way it was intended, about that all AI has to be readable. I don't think that's appropriate, as, as uh, Grant said. I, and that's why I have a recent blog post, you can look for it, called uh, Six Different Kinds of Explanation, One is Useless. Um, but the basic categories of that are, uh, how, like I said, how did you actually write the AI? How did it come to be released? That's one kind of explanation, which I think is actually the most useful for accountability. Um, the second one is, what did it actually do? So what were the inputs, what were the outputs? Now you can, you can use that, there's something called digital forensics, where you can make sure that if somebody didn't have, say, a protected characteristic, when it flipped, you can do a huge, you can use AI, going back to how do you use AI to address inequality, you can use AI to just do this massive parameter search and find out where the threshold happened, even if you don't understand exactly how the system worked. And then the third uh, broad category of, of, of this is you can actually read the code. And, and yes, if you can do that, then that's great. It, it gives you more uh, protection from liability and things. But I don't think we should restrict all AI to be totally readable. So I, I hope that, that that is the way that that stuff is going to shake out and that we'll accept these other kinds of explanation. There's always the potential for corruption, and I have seen the sort of formal logic-y guys trying to beat up the machine learning guys uh, because to try to get some of the money back for them. <laughs> and I don't, there, there's, a, there's space for all of these people, and, and I hope that they aren't just trying to use the law to capture back to, to one, only one interpretation of AI. Um, I, I, I'm going to uh, go also to this thing, what, was, what am I proudest of? I don't know if we can say this is just AI. I think, again, it's ICT, but AI helps. The fact that, um, that oh, this answers two questions at once. Uh, that although inequality is increased increasing the OECD and is therefore a threat for the reasons we've been saying, um, it's decreasing globally. And we moved something like three, three and a half billion people since 2000 out of extreme poverty. And that's partly because they had the information they needed to know how to direct their labor, to know the, the actual value of their crops so they couldn't be exploited, right? So that they could get the right kind of medical treatment. So just getting mobile phones and getting access to information has transformed lives. And I'm sure it's transformed all of our lives too. Here, how many people use a GPS to find this theater? Not that you see open lights and look, right? So we all were able to save a little time and hopefully we're all doing interesting work. And so we got a little bit more work done because we didn't have to like print out a map and understand it, right? Um, so, so I think that that's, that's true across the globe and we're doing great stuff that we're not measuring very well. And this is a challenge to economics to figure out how to measure really what is important in terms of security and sustainability, not just manufactured output, um, when we think about wealth. But we can sure look at the people that have been brought out of extreme poverty, and I've been very proud of that. Great example. So let me, I've talked a lot about health, so let me give you an example that's about saving species. Um, so one of the things, I don't speak about species, but there's a lot of other types of life on the planet, much of which we are doing bad things to it. Um, but one of the things that many biologists will tell you is we don't actually know much about the distribution of species. So one example um, would be the work of my colleague, uh, Professor Kate Jones. Um, so she uh, studies bats and where they are. Uh, and she records uh, the echolocation songs, the, different, the sounds of the different bat species. You can go and have a, have a look online to find out. Um, uses machine learning to segregate where, where they are and what they are, and can derive a map of the population. So with of those kind of things, we also have camera traps uh, in remote locations, classified species. They allow a quantification of biodiversity, which is what you need to do if you're going to start selling all those species. Um, a point about your ambulances, I, I, I think just going back to where Paul came in with, with uh, China, but, but perhaps approach it from a different angle. 
GDPR and our approach, uh, our personal enlightenment approach, is strongly uh, focuses on the values of the individual. Uh, nothing wrong with that, I would say, as, as a good personal enlightenment European. Uh, but we also do recognise that population is important in some contexts. So what's familiar to me is, for example, vaccination. Uh, well, many of us will support that, even though the actual benefit to the individual as well as the benefit to the population is very high. And we talk about things like perhaps mandating that, um, thus infringing, I mean, I know we haven't, but we talk about that, um, as perhaps a beneficial thing. So I think we might want to pay a little bit of attention to that in the area of data. Uh, and then finally to the, to the first question about how do we maximise benefit in health while minimising bias and maximising privacy. That's a really, really <laughs> big question. Um, but one thought here. Health data is very precious to us. You know, those of us who are, who are healthy probably don't mind too much sharing. Those of us who, who are not probably have rather different views. And, and, and that's, that's common in any of the studies these areas we're saying that. And, and, and it's also, once it's out, you can't get it back. Um, it's not a number you can replace in a bank account. Um, it's, it's really, so I, I, and I think it's very easy to de-anonymize uh, supposedly anonymous health data. So for example, let's say you had a treasure trove in which you had to find my data. Well, it's not going to take very long to find out my date of birth. Uh, it's published um, in various online. You're probably going to be able to find my park run record that shows I'm actually running um, ambitious parking for me, an awfully large number of time, so I probably <laughs> live somewhere near there. Uh, and I've written online about my premature daughter, so you probably can work out how old she is, and therefore what the story which your premature baby. And, and at that point, you've probably narrowed it down to two or three records, one of which is mine. So I think what that means is if we're going to get the most out of paper data, it's going to have to end up really quite private and quite close to those we trust to look after our data, mm -hmm. normally the health professionals or health systems. And so federated learning is the jargon I'm going to drop into that as a way of doing the learning close to where the data is and then exporting the interesting bit of the model and combining that. And I think that's a really interesting way to think um, about how to build, let's say, a global um, healthcare product or, or a global thing that we haven't spent enough time. Bias I haven't covered, but I think I need to let my panelists have uh, Okay, well, AI in... in um inequality, I mean, I think the answer is yes, AI can be used to tackle inequality, but the, it has to be, people, we have to want that. Um, we have to want to tackle inequality, so for a very long time it's been possible to sort of redesign um, benef social benefit systems, for example, to kind of um, personalise um, personalised benefits so that basic rights are satisfied and everybody has a right to certain things and to target benefits in that sort of way. But that isn't what we've been having. We've been having, you know, a benefits cap and, um, in, you know, very lumpy ways, you know, cutting benefits if you have more than two children and this kind of thing. You know, in a way, back to the window tax, you know, I mean, uh, and so we haven't done that. Uh, I mean, as a as a as a government, that's not what's been been done. But it but it could be yes. And I think there's all sorts of exciting ways. And you have to, but you have to want equality. That has to be the value. And I think that leads to my second point. So you asked for some good, good examples. Well, um, I, I mean, I can think of lots lots of examples. But, but I, I mean, I just so agree with you that the. the you know, in here, all, all the world's information at my, at my fingertips. And I think one of the key differences in my own... I'm going to say something nice about social media, OK? I know that's deeply unfashionable. I'm supposed to blame it for everything that's bad in the world. Um, but I'm going to say that, you, you know, the, uh, uh, the, the prevalence of social media mean that anybody, anywhere in the world, with no more resources than a mobile phone, doesn't have to be as posh a one as this one, um, can tackle injustice and campaign for policy change and campaign for rights. And that's really in incredibly exciting, to, to me anyway. Um, and, uh, you know, we should celebrate that sometimes in instead of only talking about, you know, the end of democracy and the crisis of democracy and, God, there are so many uh, books called that at the moment. <laughs> so that, that uh, leads to the last point. I mean, uh, what I do agree with you about ethics is it's just such a very broad thing. And we have to think about the kind of values and principles that we want. And one of them, 
is democracy. I mean, you, you, you talk quite a bit about that. And it's not surprising that we have to rethink some of the things we've been thinking about for hundreds and hundreds of years. Because this has all happened very quickly. Social media have only been intertwined with our political systems for 10 years, really tops. And it's not surprising that we need to catch up and go back to some of those normative principles of democracy and democratic theory and sort of rethink them and think about what we want to hold on to and what we want to promote and how we redesign democratic institutions in a world where we're all sort of unbelievably attached to these. Yes, looks like these are final words. Um, so, um, <laughs> if these are final words, I would say um, I think uh, tackling inequality is uh, is key, and uh, the classic instruments are you know getting organised as unions. So the, one of the modern issues is organising the gig workers uh, in the digital economy, and the other is redistribution through taxation. Of course, AI can be used for it, but that should not be our first question. Our first question is how do we get to the goal, which is uh, uh, more uh, um, equality. And uh, I think that it's important to uh, mm, mm, you know, have this goal first, and not first the goal, you know, uh, uh, let's use technology wherever we can, and you know, AI for good, and all of this. I mean, that's all fine, but it is probably not the most efficient way to uh, uh, create uh, uh, equality, it's probably, you know, getting organized and, uh, you know, unions and law, you know, which, uh, which gets people, uh, gig workers, rights. And uh, the same for democracy, you know, I don't think that the idea that, you know, we now have to digitalize democracy, it will heal everything. I would say rather the other way around, we have to democratize the digital because it's, uh, um, you know, it, what has been promised to us was a great system of decentral participation and so on, but actually now we are faced with huge power concentration uh, um, uh, in these in these corporations. And you know, if if you ask yourself, you know, who has the power to get uh, uh, global rules going on which parliaments have not decided, it's uh, you know, it's among others these corporations. So when we talk about the OECD and the G20, this is all executives. This has nothing to do with democracy. This is exactly the technocratic, top-down government where parliaments have no say. Now, I don't want to undervalue the work of those who have made this consensus possible, and consensus on the way to giving ourselves rules is always a good thing. But let's not confuse uh, uh, you know, these types of so-called rules, where actually they are not binding, but you know, those types of processes in the OECD with democracy. These are not democratic processes. This is an international organization which is run entirely by you know, executives and, let's be honest, by business uh, 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 departments. Yeah? So it's a difference whether a parliament, whether Westminster, or for that matter the European Parliament uh, has decided uh, on the rules or whether the OECD has decided uh, uh, on these rules. And you know um, we have to not uh, put the world uh, on its head when we talk um, about democracy. So my last word uh, um, is on this question of um, the rules system. I think what you are saying is absolutely correct. But the fact is, you know, data protection is a right which exists for individuals, not for corporations. The GDPR gives no right in that sense. Uh, to, to, to corporations, and so there is a specific pillar for the individuals, and that's what fundamental rights are about. On the other things, you know, do we need to differentiate in law between the data harvester uh, and the platform and so on? I'm not so sure. Not on everything on which social science or economy differentiate, and not on every business model, we need a specific new rule. I mean, the law has to typicize, and many types of business models, many types of functions are actually covered by the same law. So GDPR will apply to all of these different pillars which, which you mention. But it doesn't mean that as an economist or as a, as a sociologist, you should not mean, make those differentiations. But for the law to respond to every type of differentiation which we find in the world, whether in business or in other contexts, is completely impossible. The law has to typicize, and that is actually the key of regulating today. We want to stay technologically neutral, 
which means we can't use the buzzwords of the day. We cannot incorporate very concretely every specific business model in the law because the law must be so dynamic that without being constantly rewritten, it can keep pace through new interpretation with the fast-moving business models and technology which the future brings. Thank you very much. Um, well, thanks to the panel for a really fascinating discussion. Um, probably we should have done a wine reception afterwards to keep more of the audience here. But thank you, everyone, for staying till the end and for excellent questions. So.